Hello, I'm Bianca Benedetti Fang from UBS Wealth Management USA's business owner client segment. Welcome to Founders and Funders, our conversation series with women entrepreneurs focusing on how they built, exited, and supported successful businesses. We are thrilled to be continuing the series in our second year. To learn more about female founders and funders that we've interviewed and to keep up to date on all episodes in the series, please subscribe to the Founders and Funders playlist on UBS's YouTube channel. Leading this month's Founders and Funders UBS conversation is Lauren Gorshi. Lauren is the Complex Director of UBS's Los Angeles Private Wealth Management Office. I'm excited to have her lead the conversation with Minnie Ingersoll, a partner at 10110 Ventures and the co-founder and former COO of Shift.com. What's particularly exciting about today's conversation is with Minnie, we have someone that embodies both sides of the founder and funder. I'm absolutely looking forward to this discussion. Lauren, take it away. Thanks so much, Bianca. Today on Founders and Funders, I'm excited to introduce our special guest who represents both sides of the equation, Minnie Ingersoll. Minnie Ingersoll is a partner at 10110 and host of LA Venture Podcast, which features some of Los Angeles' most exciting venture funders. 10110 is a venture fund based in LA, investing in early stage software and data companies. Prior to 10110, Minnie was COO and co-founder of Shift Technologies, an online marketplace for used cars, which went public in October 2020 via SPAC or Special Purpose Acquisition Company. Minnie started her career as an early product manager at Google. She studied computer science at Stanford and has an MBA from Harvard Business School. In her spare time, Minnie self-describably surfs baby waves and raises baby people. Minnie, hello, and welcome to Founders and Funders. It's great to be with you and have you on the other side of the interview exchange for a time. Thanks, Lauren. Glad to be here. Minnie, let's start in the here and now before we take a look back at Shift. Would you mind telling us about your work at 10110, please? How did you make the jump from entrepreneur to venture capital? Sure. So 10110, we're a seed stage fund here in LA, and our sweet spot is writing a $1 million check uh, into really compelling founders. And uh, usually for us, that's someone who's raising maybe two to $4 million in what we would call a seed round. And as far as making the jump, as you said, I was running Shift, uh, my company, and um, I decided to move to LA. And, you know, kind of simply, I was looking for a job. <laughs> And uh, I decided to move to LA to be closer to my family and because I love it in LA. And the thing that I'd done was I'd gotten really involved with the female founders groups in the Bay Area and the Techstars mentorship groups. Um, so when I moved to LA, I kind of continued doing all of that and being able to be a VC, you get to continue doing all of that, but you also get to write, you know, million dollar checks to support these entrepreneurs and, um, you know, and call it a job. A lot of different companies and a lot of different conversations that you have. So tell us a little bit more. What are the types of companies and entrepreneurs that excite you? Who do you like to work with and who do you like to invest with? Sure. So for us, 10110, we were all technical founders. Um, Shift is obviously a used car site, but it's actually a fairly technical, it's an online marketplace for used cars. Um, so my, my two partners and I, we were all technical founders of, of startups and 10110 started sort of as an extended angel portfolio. And, um, that tends to be what we invest in as well. I think in your introduction, you said software and data companies, those do tend to be our sweet spot. Um, but for me, like the litmus test is, would I go work with this company? Like if, if I were looking for a job right now, would I want to jump in and go, you know, apply for a job at this company? Um, and so, you know, fundamentally for us, it's it's a great founding team. Let's talk a little bit about Shift. We had mentioned as part of our introduction that this was a company you co-founded and a website for used car sales. I understand that you were actually on maternity leave from Google when you made the decision to co-found Shift. And I'd love to know a little bit more about how motherhood really wove itself into some of the, the key moments of your entrepreneurial uh, journey 
besides the obvious, of course. Yeah. And that's actually what we were talking about right before this. Um, just parenting in the time of um, online learning. And um, but I'll, I'll go back to 2013, which is when I had my my first child. And uh, yeah, as you said, I'd been at Google a long time. I decided to take some maternity leave. It was my first baby. I had no idea how much time I would want to take off. So I said, I'm going to maximize my time. I'm going to take six months off. And it turns out that, you know, a few months into that, it's really hard to stay home with a tiny baby the whole time. Um, and I actually uh, was sort of itching to, to start something. And I like dabbling. And my co-founder, George, had worked with me. I sometimes remind him that he worked for me at Google um, because he became my boss at Shift. But, uh, you know, he'd been talking to me about this idea for a long time and I was on maternity leave and we lived in San Francisco. We both lived in the Castro kind of down the street from each other. So I just um, I get up really early with the baby, um, you know, spend four hours with my baby and show up at his house at 10 o'clock in the morning. And that was kind of the start of shift was just me showing up at his house every day. And it was great because I could bring my baby to his house, which was our office. Um, and it was just a very flexible time. And, um, and you know, the journey continues, which is we then raised with my second child, which was just sort of a year and a half later, was right when we were raising our $20 million Series A. So I, um, I then had sort of two, you know, baby and a toddler, right? While, um, you know, right after we'd raised $20 million and we were, you know, hiring like crazy. So it was Definitely motherhood was woven closely into the whole experience. I'd love to know what's your take um, for, for women who are hoping to get pregnant or maybe they're already pregnant or, or have young children vis-a-vis -vis this desire to start a business. Some of us are um, inconsolable planners, if you will. And sometimes there's some elements that you just can't plan for. But what advice would you have either for a younger version of yourself or for other women who are facing similar decisions? I have so many thoughts, Lauren. I um, okay. My first thought is that um, I don't, I don't really like giving advice to other people. <laughs> so um, so it's a hard starting point. But I um, I I mean that really legitimately, which is I think it's hard. Sometimes people tell you, look, you should take your full six months off. You should take two months off. You should take two weeks off. Um, turn your email off. And I actually prefer when people don't tell you what to do. Um, and so uh, I heard a panel with Susan Wojcicki. Okay, so given all of that, I'm still going to give advice, um, which is I heard this panel with Susan Wojcicki. Susan was, she's the CEO of YouTube. Google was starting her garage. She has five children, if I remember correctly. Um, when I knew her, I think she had three. Um, but she was on this panel and same question. And she said, look, when you want to have your babies, have your babies. And everything else can kind of fit around that. And I found that so compelling and true, which is your babies are your babies. Like they're, And the rest is kind of work and life. And, um, and it's never going to be the perfect time. And you can't always plan for these things. So, um, so I kind of stuck with that, which is it was not the perfect time for me to have children. Like all the, the Legos were not, you know, aligned perfectly. You know, the mortgage, the the spousal, you know, um, his job, everything else. Um, but the other thing that like when I then, you know, our company grew really quickly, shift grew really quickly. And so I got to craft our maternity leave, um, uh, really, sorry, our parental leave. Um, and what, what we decided to do, and it worked for us, uh, um, was to just say it's going to be flexible. And so you don't need to decide ahead of time. So some of it is, you know, you're going into having your first child. You don't know yourself whether you're going to want to come back to work quickly or not quickly or part time or sometimes from home. So we just had a very flexible. We said, you don't need to tell us ahead of time. We're going to be it's going to be like an adaptive policy where when you feel like coming back to work, we're going to welcome you back to work. So that was our approach. Um, and uh, and it's worked out. I have since had a third kid. So um you know, it's, it's, it's hard, but obviously, um, uh, the most fulfilling thing I've done. Incredible. And I love how you've taken your own experiences and that of other colleagues and employees and actually advocated for change within your sphere of influence. That's so cool. Um, 
you know, if you think uh, a little bit in parallel, one of the things that we talk about on this program is how women are underrepresented in entrepreneurship and really only receive a very small percent of venture backing. You've been on both sides of the proverbial table, if you will. So how did you and your co-founder approach the challenging landscape? Yeah, so so first off, um, again, this is 2013. I mean, we raised a couple hundred million dollars over a few years. So, um, but when I started, the first time that we you know, this is still a little while ago where I think the conversation has changed a lot in terms of female founders and supporting female founders and realizing that that having more diversity around the, the venture capital in the venture capital rooms. But when I first did it, it was intimidating to me. And, you know, as you said in, in my bio, you know, I'm not, I went to Harvard Business School, like I should, I don't know, I should feel confident marching into Sequoia's office and asking them for $20 million, but I certainly did not. I certainly felt like a bit of a rube, like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, these people are people I've read about, you know, in my career, I know their names. Um, so I certainly felt nervous and unprepared. Um, my partner, my co-founder, who was the CEO, um, he's actually a gay man. So he also, I think, brought some of, some of, you know, that history um, with him. And fundamentally, the way we thought about things, the way I think we approached it was, well, we're gonna just build a really compelling business. And if I could give you know one piece of advice, um, it's, it's the VC is not your customer. Don't try to too much reverse engineer what you think the VC wants to hear. But if, if you have a very compelling business, um, it, it, people will listen. And so for us, we were selling used cars online, as I said, like we started, we didn't have shift.com. Obviously, when you start, you don't own that URL. Um, we were, you know, mostly flipping cars on Craigslist is what you would say we were doing. We were buying a car on Craigslist, we were selling it on Craigslist. And, you know, that built up and we got, you know, parking spots at Costco that you could rent monthly, um, that sort of thing. But at some point, we were hustling really hard. We were sitting in Tesla dealerships. Um, because Tesla won't take your trade-in car. And in the Bay Area, there are a lot of people buying Teslas. So at some point, we ended up landing a Tesla partnership. And we started to realize that sort of our business was hitting a tipping point where we had a Tesla partnership. We had a couple million dollars in, um, in GMV and in, in gross merchandise value, <clears throat> sort of uh, top line revenue that we were doing. And we felt like, we can go to Sand Hill Road, even if we don't feel prepared, even if we don't feel like we know what we're doing when we're marching into Sequoia's office, but we've got a compelling business. Like we've got something we feel confident we can show. And that would be, um, you know, that would be my best piece of advice, which is if you've got a really compelling business, you will walk in with more confidence when you know your numbers and you know your business. Um, that said, at 10.110, my, um, I had a colleague named Austin, Austin is an African-American man. I'm a woman. We sit on a panel together. And uh, this is back in, in real life. So we were sitting on a panel back in real life. And after the panel, we both write the same size checks. After the panel, all the women line up to talk to me and all the people of color line up to talk to Austin. And you can't help see how that cycle tends to continue, which is the more people who look like you who are writing checks, um, the easier it is for entrepreneurs to find people who they feel comfortable approaching, asking not just for funding, but also potentially asking for advice. This is why representation matters, truly. Yes. So you gave a couple of pieces of really good advice um, to really focus on the business and have a compelling business proposition, um, to remember that venture capital is ultimately not your customer or client base and to keep focused on that. And thirdly, to think about an inflection point. And so sitting on the other side of the table, from 10110, what are the key things that you look for in companies that you're looking at? You obviously invest not only in women run uh, specific businesses, what are some of the other uh, key attributes in addition to wanting to sign up for uh, working potentially as an employee yourself? What are some of the other attributes you're looking for? Yeah, I think one thing that I underestimated going into shift about what I would actually be doing as a COO was communication. And 
and I, it's a huge part of the pitch when someone is coming and talking to you. It's um, a huge part, obviously, when they're hiring, when they're raising money, but when they're forming partnerships, um, yeah, to selling to customers. Um, and so one of the things I'm looking for is not someone who looked up online or took an entrepreneurship class that said, here's how you talk about your, um, your market size. You make a Tam Tom Sam slide. This is what they teach you in, in MBA school. You make these bubbles and they've got your total addressable market, you know, this, that, and the other. That's not what I'm looking for. I don't need someone who's like learned the playbook. I want someone who can look me in the eye and tell me about their vision and tell me about why this, why they are so compelled to drop everything that they're doing and really convince me that, that this is their life work. This is something that they are that I want to fund because they are super compelling. On the flip side of that, like the advice that I sometimes give around that dynamic of pitching funders is that if you want advice, you can ask for advice. Um, like if you want feedback, you can ask for feedback. And actually it, it has surprised me being a VC, being a funder, that it's very hard to give advice because the last thing I want to do is sort of... Um, rain on your parade, if you will. And I don't want to make you feel bad about your idea and tell you what's wrong with it. Um, I'm very sensitive to founders who like, I might not see it, but it might be fantastic. And yet, if you really want advice, you can ask me directed questions. Like, do you think I came across as too, um, uh, too unsure about my numbers? Do you think I came across as too aggressive on my presentation? You know, Whatever you think it might be, you can ask me. And then that really opens the door for me to be more honest with my feedback. And um, without making sweeping generalizations, I do think it's something that women do um, particularly well. Is they, they I, I've seen a lot of women, and maybe it's because I'm a woman, they feel comfortable, but um, I would love to um, be open to that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We talked a little bit about you making the jump from shift. So certainly an exit is an important decision, especially from a company that you co-founded. You were able to help the company raise several rounds of funding, and I'm sure you helped put it on its path towards eventually going public via SPAC in 2020. Can you just tell us a little bit about your own thought process on exiting a, a company and what our entrepreneurs should know and be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, there's different types of exiting a company, right? There's exiting a company because the company is exiting, um, which might be the way a lot of people might exit a company. Um, in my case, it was really hard. And it wasn't like, it wasn't something you can do lightly when it's your own company. Uh, for me, I was having my third child. And with my second child, as I said, we just raised $20 million. I, I took about two weeks off when I had my second child. Um, and it was just... There was so much going on and I was able to bring her to the office with me. And um, again, like to go back to my advice, which is try not to judge people. I felt like a little judge for being back at the office, but I really wanted to be at the office for my second child. For my third child, I didn't really want to be back at the office. Um, I had three kids under four at that point um, and I really wanted to be home with them. So with my third kid, and obviously I was pregnant, so I was able to do sort of a six month notice on exiting. And I also knew that I wanted to move to LA. Um, but I think the important thing to think about there, and it's still so true, is how closely, well, one, how small the world is. And so how much you still interact with those people that you are leaving from your last job, like how much your network keep pop, keeps popping up. Um, and also, you know, shift is my legacy. We're still talking about shift. So I have every incentive to leave on as high a note as I possibly can. And I think that's completely true for all people, which is when you leave, even if you're frustrated or whatever, um, it, leave on that high note. For me, I still call George, my co-founder all the time, right? I have people still approach me, um, trying to do a partnership with shift, anything like that. So I still need that connective tissue with shift. And so, um, you know, I, I even think in retrospect, I could have exited more gracefully, but um, tried to set shift up um, as well as I could. Minnie, last question from me. Much like we need more great 
women run businesses and startups, we also uh, need to advance more women in senior venture capital roles. What's some of your advice you have, uh, both for the industry as well as for women that are interested in making that transition into venture capital? Yeah, again, I have a lot of thoughts on both sides of the question. Um, so for women who are trying to enter VC, I have different thoughts. So one is, look, I hear Elon Musk, for instance, talking about how he's going to, I can't remember, like land spacecraft on asteroids or something, right? And he says that and we all think it's amazing, it's world changing. And then I hear women who say, I'm not sure if I can get into venture capital. I'm like, if freaking Elon Musk can land a spacecraft on an asteroid, you too can enter venture capital. Like we can make this, like it, it can be done. It can, it's within your capabilities. Um, so then how to get there? Um, so the first thing is being able to admit that that's what you want and say it like, whether that's what you want or it's something else. I, at times was hesitant to say what I wanted. So I wanted to move to LA and I wanted to be a partner at a venture capital fund. That was hard for me to say. It felt presumptuous that I was going to show up in LA, not knowing a lot of people and just say like, hi, I want to be the new partner at your fund. Um, and, and it took some use. To, it took me a little bit of like getting used to just saying that because it's not going to happen if you're not saying what you're, what you want. Um, the second thing is, uh, I think that especially for, for people earlier in their careers, there's a lot of opportunity to act as if. And so the, the people in that I've really built a strong network with here, some of whom are, let's say, uh, you know, young students, uh, MBA students or master's students or um, just people earlier in their career who want to get into venture capital. So they go to the pitch nights, they go to the hackathons, they, um, they, they sort of, you know, they're in the mix, they're in the community and they then send deals my way and they kind of get to know who likes what sort of deal, what sort of entrepreneur. I have three little kids at home. I'm not able to go out in the evenings and like go to the pitch competitions all the time. And so there's some people who are just building up their network by acting as if they're not actually writing angel checks in, in some cases, but they're sort of saying, I would write an angel check here. Minnie, how about this deal? Would you like it? And I built up a relationship with those people. Um, and, you know, fantastic if they can write checks themselves. If they bring me the deal, like I'm even more inclined to say, look, can we carve out $2,000, um, like a small amount? Um, but if nothing else, I think that's, you can act as if um, you're investing even before you are investing. The other thing you can do is you can have a thesis. You can become an expert. And um, it, it's remarkable to me how little it takes to become an expert online. <laughs> and I certainly like things like NFTs right now. No one was an expert eight months ago. So everyone who is currently an expert in NFTs has, you know, has only had, you know, whatever, a year's worth of expertise under their belts. And so it's certainly possible to become an expert. It doesn't have to be in something that's cutting, cutting edge like NFTs. It could be, you know, how, um, how modern parenting works as an example, right? So I think that you can become an expert and then for interesting deals in the industry, you become known, you have a, a, a point of view. And then people like me at funds will call you up and say, what do you think of this company? You know, what do you think is hot? So I think there's a lot of things there. To touch briefly on the other side of things, as you did ask about, you know, what the industry can do. Um, I think we can all think about how decisions are made. And, and that's probably my biggest thing. So I, I was at Google and, um, you know, a number of years ago, the way that decisions were made was it was about engineering allocation and you'd come in as a product manager and you would pound the table to some degree about why you needed more engineering allocation. And, you know, in venture capital, I think there's a stereotype that you come in and you act confident in your five-year projections. And if you act confident in your five-year projections, you will get funded. And we can all think about how do we make decisions? Is it that we give more engineers or give funding to people who pound the table and act confident? Or are we um, making space and having processes that, um, that reward sort of different ways of thinking and different ways of presenting, so. I love that. You gave so many um, practical tips and uh, advice and perspective. Minnie, this has been an awesome conversation. I appreciate not only your experience, but your passion that you shared uh, here with us today at UBS. 
And um, I look forward to continuing the conversation with other female founders and funders as well. Over to you, Bianca. Thank you, Lauren and Minnie. What I love about this series and all of our conversations with female founders is the openness, lifting the curtain behind so many areas where personal and professional intersect. Everything from being ready to be back at the office after parental leave to the ins and outs of venture funding. The sharing of insights from owners and funders will really help the next generation of entrepreneurs find their footing. Minnie, I know you don't prefer to give advice, but I follow your LA Venture podcast and can't get enough of your guidance. Truly, thank you for sharing your insights and joining us today for our latest episode of Founders and Funders. To our viewers, don't forget to check out the Founders and Funders playlist and stay tuned for our future conversations. We're excited for what 2022 will bring the series and hope you to have you back to see future conversations. You can save the Founders and Funders playlist to get updates automatically right here on UBS's YouTube channel. I encourage you to speak with your UBS financial advisor, and you can also find more UBS resources on financial planning and wealth building, as well as our latest resources to support women and business owners by visiting UBS.com slash women and UBS.com slash business services. Thank you again for placing your trust with UBS and your financial advisor teams. Be well.